Greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's today's presentation on rendering. Uh, today's presenter is Dr. Jessica Meisinger. Uh, she is the Director of Education, Science, and Communication for both the National Renders Association and the Fats and Proteins Research Foundation. She received a Bachelor of Science degrees in both Animal Science and Sociology from Iowa State University, a Master's in Meat Science and Muscle Biology from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, and a PhD in Meat Science from Colorado State University. She is originally from Urbandale, Iowa, and is currently residing in Alexandria, Virginia. Dr. Meisinger manages all of the varied communication and education programs that both NRA and FPRF have launched, as well as managing FPRF's research portfolio and any other jobs that need completion. Uh, thank you very much for attending, and we will now turn it over to Dr. Meisinger. Okay, uh, thank you. If anyone has any questions and they don't want to ask it during this, feel free to send me an email or give me a call. So this is going to be a pretty general discussion on rendering. If you have more in-depth questions, I'm always happy to answer them. So to start with byproducts and rendering, what exactly is a byproduct? A byproduct is a secondary uh, print product obtained during the manufacture of a principal commodity. You're not raising animals for the rendered ingredients. So they are a byproduct. There are two types of renders. We have packer renders that are packers that do their own rendering, usually in-house. Um, most of the major meat companies are are like this, like Tyson or JBS. Independent renders are not associated with a particular packing plant. Darling is the biggest example of uh, independent render. So a little bit of history of the rendering industry. The rendering industry has been around for a very long time. Native Americans <laughs> showed the pilgrims how to use blood as a fertilizer. Uh, people used tallow for candles and soap for a very long time. In fact, a lot of very high-end soaps still use tallow. If you look at the ingredient label, it's very, very good on your skin, especially if it's sensitive. But the real need for the rendering industry came with increased animal production. So as farms intensified, so did the need for rendering skyrocketed. Grocery stores were popularized, and grocery stores wanted boxed beef. So when you're cutting down a carcass for boxed beef, you have a lot left over. Fallen animals then became a concern. What do you do with them? And all this boxed beef results in trimmings. It not only results in trimmings at the packing plant, but when it gets to the grocery store, if they have a butcher cutting it, it has another set of trimmings again. What do you do with all of that? So the invisible industry was born. And the renderers called themselves the invisible industry. That wasn't a name they were given. Rendering industry in the U.S. NRA represents the U.S. and Canada, or as I call it, the other NRA. Um, there's approximately 270 facilities in the U.S., about 30 in Canada. It's an industry that has about a $10 billion annual revenue and takes in 56 billion pounds of raw material each and every year. That's 70 million kilograms of raw material every day. If there was no rendering and you sent this all to a landfill, all available landfill space in the United States would be used completely within four years. So. I'm sure most of you know the statistics on U.S. animal ag annual production. That's not the number that I need you to be looking at quite as much. It's how much of each animal isn't used for human food. So about 50% of, uh, of cattle isn't used for human food in the United States. Uh, about 44% of a pig. And that's a lot of excess product. Uh, there are countries that don't have as robust of a rendering industry because they would disagree that 50% of a cow is not considered edible. So in countries that eat a lot more of their animals, they have less need for rendering. This amounts to a lot of material. 
So here's a picture of a rendering plant. You could be thinking, this looks just like every other plant. And I would totally agree with that. That's my point. Rendering plants tend to look just like all other packing plants, all other plants in general. The U.S. has a number of, of these plants, as I said, to under, about 270. And they're spread out throughout the country. There are some zones that have no rendering plants or not very many. They tend to be concentrated where the animals are concentrated as well, which is logical. Um, the little triangles are packer renders. Well, the stars are independent renders. So there's a lot of them. A lot of people, when they think about rendering, only think about dead stock. They think of you know, growing up on the farm and the rendering truck coming when they'd have an animal go down. That is not the majority of what renders take. In fact, dead stock only represents about 4% of um, of the, re the product stream or the raw material stream. Um, it's a lot more of everything else. So offal, bones, fat, and trimmings, blood, animal. so then the animals that are dead on arrival in trans are on farms, hides, restaurant grease. Restaurant grease was something I never thought about before I had this job. I mean, I assumed it had to go somewhere, but I never really thought about it. American restaurants produce 4.7 billion pounds of used restaurant grease a year. That is an enormous number of, re of grease. Uh, places like McDonald's, they use the grease for as long as they can, but eventually you cannot use it anymore and you have to do something with it. We take about 2.4 billion pounds of that to recycle. If it's not recycled, it causes a large problem for cities. I read a statistic that said that over 75% of municipal pipes were 50% or more clogged by grease, and that's usually restaurant grease. It gets concrete-like when it's in pipes, very, very hard to chisel out, and it's a really good breeding ground for bacteria in a public health hazard. So it's a very important thing for restaurants to have a program to get rid of their grease, even if you take out the sustainability aspect. Feathers get rendered uh, grocery store material. We take about 2.7, well, we take about 1.9 billion pounds of the 2.7 billion pounds of meat or seafood that's lost in retail. So that's meat and seafood that's either expired or past its best buy date. Needs to go somewhere. If you have ever wondered what happens to those rotisserie chickens the next day, we are what happens to those rotisserie chickens the next day. There's no reason that those should be put in a landfill when they're still good food. And then also some recalled product. Oh, as I said, fallen animals, there, we definitely take some fallen animals. About half of them are, are rendered, which results in about 4.5% of rendered products coming from fallen animals. It's more of a service to farmers than it is a revenue stream. Edible versus not intended for human consumption is something I run up against a lot when I give talks about rendering. Edible foods can always go into rendering. So anything that's in a meat packing plant can always end up in a rendering plant. But once something goes to rendering, it can never go back to human food. It's a one-way street and it becomes not intended for human consumption. So a lot of times when I talk to public groups, they'll say, so rendering, that's like the hot dogs, right? And no, it is not like hot dogs. It that it, There is rendering that's on the edible side of a plant. We don't, that isn't our side of the plant. The lard you see in the grocery store comes from the edible side, not from the rendering side. This is all still safe for feed for animals. The rendering process is very, very simple. I'm not saying it's easy to do, but it's very simple to explain. Sometimes it's so simple to explain, I think people think I'm dumbing it down, which I am not. Uh, there's two ways to do rendering, either through a continuous flow or a batch cooker system. Almost all major plants in the U.S. have continuous flow systems now. They're much more energy efficient. They use, take less labor from your workers. 
they just make a lot more sense, but some do still have batch cookers. Uh, rendering is done by steam. It's done for 245 to 290 degrees Fahrenheit for about 40 to 90 minutes, depending on what the raw material is. And this inactivates bacteria, viruses, protozoa, and parasites. The basic process is on the screen now. So you take the raw materials and you grind them so that they're all a uniform size. That then goes through the heat processing, the cooker, and uh, after it's done, it goes through a press. When it gets pressed, the fat goes one direction, that gets centrifuged and it's finished, and the protein goes another direction. That is ground again for uniformity of size, and it's finished. So as you can see, that's a very simple process. I am um, come from the meat industry. This is not the flow chart I would have for literally anything on the meat side. So this is very, very simple. Rendering destroys bacteria of food safety concern. The raw tissue does have some bacteria in it, obviously, but once it is cooked, post-pressed, all that bacteria is completely killed. There's a lot of ingredients and items produced by rendering. I have noticed that a lot of times when the National Cattlemen's Beef Association or National Pork Producers Council uses a graph to show what, uh, like in Wow That Cow, where they have all the places that a cow goes other than meat, they're usually talking about all the places in rendering so that animal goes other than meat. So you have the things like meat and bone meal, which go into feed. You have the greases and oils, which can go into fuel or feed. You have tallow, which can go in many different directions, and then hides. So if you have any interest in this, I can send you more information. It's pretty interesting how many places have animal products in them that you might not think about on a day-to-day -day basis. So about a third of rendered, in, uh, rendered ingredients are used in livestock feed. About a third are used in pet food and about a third go to biofuel with uh, that extra one to 10% being all of those other uses you saw on the previous slide. The main products you get after the rendering process is meat and bone meal, meat meal, and all these can be animal specific. So you can have lamb meal, lamb meat and bone meal, whatever. Tallow, poultry fat, choice white grease and yellow grease, feather meal, blood meal, and poultry meal and poultry byproduct meal. So you go from this, if you look at the upper left hand side, that is poultry meal and then choice white grease, blood meal and meat and bone meal, to fertilizer, pet food, biofuel and, or livestock feed, biofuel and pet food. So when I was in my animal science classes, we didn't talk a whole lot about pets. I think they talk more about it now, but it's easy to forget how important the pet industry is for the animal industry to think about. In the US, cats and dogs are by far the most popular pets. About 45 million households have cats, about 57 million households have dogs. A lot of those households have more than one dog or cat. Some of those households have both cats and dogs. The total expenditures on pets is around $60 billion. It's a gigantic industry and it's growing. Rendered ingredients are very popular in pet diets. Dogs and cats belong to the order carnivora. Um, cats are obligate carnivores. They have to eat meat or they die. You can feed your dog cat food, but you cannot feed a cat only dog food or they will die because of their lack of taurine. Dogs can eat a balanced vegetarian or vegan diet. If you've never seen that annotation there where it's V-E-G uh, asterisk N, that's how you cover everything from vegan to vegetarian without having to write it all out. So if you have one takeaway from today, there's one. But I think the commercials are always really interesting because they say 
let your dog live like it would in the wild or your cat. Your dog or cat in the wild wouldn't be eating kibbles. They would be hunting. And when your dog kills a chicken, they don't just eat the breast. They start at the viscera. So if you really want to feed your dog like they'd be eating in the wild, you should only be feeding them byproducts. So why use rendered ingredients in pet food? Well, poultry byproduct meal is more nutritious than poultry meal, which is more nutritious than poultry. It has a lot more vitamins and a lot more minerals in it. It's highly, highly palatable, and animals like the taste of rendered products. All they have rendered ingredients have energy, flavor, texture, and nutrients, including minerals. When you think about minerals like phosphorus, you have to get phosphorus from places like phosphorus rock. Phosphorus rock, if you're not using rendered ingredients. Phosphorus rock is non-renewable, and it's running out worldwide. When you look at it from a sustainability point of view, phosphorus rock is not sustainable. I think that you'd have a hard time arguing that mining is a sustainable industry, and especially when you can get the product somewhere else that's completely sustainable. So when you, I'm going to touch on sustainability for a bit. When you think about sustainability, there's a probably a million definitions out there for what is sustainability, but the EPA defines it as sustainability creates and maintains the conditions under which humans and nature can exist in productive harmony that permit fulfilling the social, economic, and other requirements of present and future generations. If you notice in there, they do cover the economic piece. If you are trying to be so sustainable that you put yourself out of business, that is not going to be a sustainable industry. Rendering is extremely green. Rendering annually re recycles a lot of greenhouse gases like carbon, nitrogen, like carbon and nitrogen. Those numbers never mean a lot to me on their own, but you can see that the greenhouse gas reduction by rendering all materials that can be rendered is the same as taking over 12 million cars a year off the road are planting 1.7 billion seedling trees. And that car statistic is actually used a lot when you read about sustainability. A lot of groups compare what they're doing to how many cars it's worth taking off the road. And the EPA agrees with us. If you look at this food recovery hierarchy, feeding animals, which is the green, and is where rendering fits in, is higher than all other uses. So rendering feeds animals and has industrial uses, which is higher than landfilling or composting. This matters from a global sustainability standpoint. There's huge population growth projected worldwide. We all see those projections all the time. And they always bring up how as countries get richer, they eat more meat, which is true. And But they leave out that these households also get more pets or a pet at all. And when you get a pet, you have to feed that pet something. So, you know, this all matters. All this has to come from somewhere. Sustainability really matters, and the animal industry is already doing it. It's not something new we have to do. We're already doing it. We've been doing it. Animal scientists and farmers have always cared about using all the animal. That's why they're saying, like, everything but the squeal, which is something we need to bring up more often because a lot of times people who grew up in an urban environment have never heard sayings like that and they like it. They like knowing that farmers are committed to using everything that they are producing. So a lot of times I get the question, who regulates the renders or do you have any regulation? It's hard not to laugh when people ask if we have any regulation because of course we do. But uh, so we are regulated to ensure the safety employs the public and the environment by states and the FDA, EPA, USDA, and other agencies. We also follow the American Association of Feed Control Officials, or AFCO. They publish the official definitions of each ingredient. And then companies on top of that often have their own requirements. We have our rendering code of practice as well, which is a training and auditing program that, to enhance the quality and safety of our products as well as regulatory compliance. So we help our members out with that. 
in 2010, Congress passed the Food Safety Modernization Act, or FISMA. It was signed into law by President Obama in 2011, and it had the goal of shifting the focus of federal regulators from response to prevention of contamination. This is going to seem really familiar to USDA because it's very, very similar to HACCP. We never say the phrase HACCP when we're talking about it, but it's very HACCP-like. It gives FDA mandatory recall authority, which they did not have before. Uh, they can they have access to records in the case of serious illness or death. They have the authority to collect fees for reinspection and recalls. There will be a targeted FDA inspection of high-risk facilities, as well as whistleblower protection. Meatpacking plants that render their own byproducts are going to have to comply with both HACCP and FSMA. They will have to be uh, in compliance with both USDA and FDA inspectors. So the animal protein producers industry, so API, is one of the committees of NRA, and they put together this rendering code of practice in 2005. The concept is that we can have one audit for FSMA compliance and that will give you also joint certification in the American Feed Industry Association's Feed Safe Food Safe Feed Audit. And hopefully we'll get you on a lesser priority list for inspections because you can prove that you're already doing it. It will be benchmarked with the international programs like the Global Food Safety Initiative. We updated it in 2015 and 2017 and we'll continue to update it as uh, rules get clarified. Here are, there. you have to follow good manufacturing principles. Good manufacturing principles have been long used in rendering. They are an important piece of the code of practice. And so we were more ready for this than a lot of the feed industries that did not have HACCP-like programs in place. So the centerpiece of these preventative controls is the written food safety plan. Let's see. The plan must include hazard analysis, preventative controls, recall plan, monitoring, corrective action, and verification. If any of you are HACCP certified, as I'm sure some of you are, that looks mighty familiar because it's essentially HACCP. Everyone working in the plant manufacturing animal food, including ingredients, must be a qualified individual trained in food safety, and the person in charge of developing and implementing the required food safety plan must be a preventative controls qualified individual. That training can be done via a course of standardized curriculum or through job experience, and the preventative control qualified individual may work in the facility, be an employee of the company, but not at that facility, or be a consultant. So that's a little bit about FISMA specifically. So if you're wondering how does rendering compare to other methods of disposal such as composting or anaerobic digestion, we have an infographic on just that. If you'd like to look closer at this infographic, I'd love to give you copies of it, either electronically or hard copies of it. Um, you can see the rendering stacks up very well against industrial composting and anaerobic digestion. And in a graph, uh, rendering has controlled, consistent processes, timely processing of raw materials. Uh, the greenhouse gases are avoided, which they are not in composting. The end products are regulated. The wastewater is controlled. Uh, and it kills pathogens reliably. I think a lot of this will come in the composting and digestion industries eventually, but they are not currently mature industries, and rendering is. So the regulations are there for us, and they're not quite there for composting and anaerobic digestion specifically yet. There are a lot of jobs in rendering. In case you're considering a big job shift, I can tell you more about that if you have some interest. A little bit about the associations. 
NRA was founded in 1933 to address current industry issues, promote domestic and international marketing, support research, and provide education and information for the industry that has slightly shifted because now we provide education and information for the industry and the public. As I said in one of the first slides, we used to be called the invisible industry, and we called ourselves that. No one was all that interested in what we did. But as people have gotten more interested in sustainability and where everything is going, they have started caring about rendering. And we were there the whole time, of course. And so we have been stepping more into the spotlight, which has been a challenge in some ways because we're not used to it. Uh, we have a strong international marketing wing. They, we have offices in Mexico and China, as, long, as well as consultants in a number of other offices. The Fats and Proteins Research Foundation was founded in 1962 to direct and manage research for the industry. We fund about $300,000 of research a year. And then API, which was founded in 1984 to promote biosecurity member and the members conduct weekly process control verification testings to be members. So other resources I would be happy to give you directly. You saw the one infographic. We have a second one called Rendering is Recycling. We also have a pamphlet that's very similar to this. It has all this information I just gave you, but in a very, very reader-friendly format. We have a magazine called Render Magazine. It's free, it comes out every two months, so you can go to rendermagazine.com and sign up for it. We would love to have you receive our magazine. We published a paper in the Journal of Animal Science two years ago uh, entitled Rendering, Rendered Ingredients Significantly Influence the Sustainability, Quality, and Safety of Pet Food. Pretty easy read, it has a lot of information about in it. So if you have any interest in sustainability, or how rendering stacks up to anaerobic digestion and composting, I really recommend reading this journal article. It's an, it is a very easy read. I'm not just saying oh. And I'm not just saying that because I wrote it. We also have a book called Essential Rendering. You can buy it from us for about thirty dollars, or the entire book is available in PDF format on our website, nationalrenderers.com. So this is my final slide. If you have any questions, I would love to answer them. If you scan that QR code, you'll go to our video about rendering. And we're on pretty much every social media platform. So that makes sense. So if you have any questions, you can let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meisinger. Any questions for Dr. Meisinger? Yes, this is uh, Anna Ruman. I had a question on uh, renderings limitations for taking liquids. Sure, we can take liquids. It's gonna be plant specific, but a lot of them already do. They just pipe them directly in. It's how they take blood as well as how they take all that restaurant grease. So most of them can take liquids. The independent render is a plant. Well, a packing plant does too because they're rendering all their own blood. All right, it, so would it become a volume problem for them if a plant does take it, or do they have to have a certain amount of solids or not? Hmm. Well, I'm not sure about that. If it was switching mostly into fat, it wouldn't be a problem because it would just be making a different product. Um, it actually can be a bigger problem the other direction because if there's not enough fat, you, it's hard to get the temperature up high enough. So, no, I think they could probably render quite a bit of liquids. A lot of them already do, especially when they're getting a lot of restaurant grease in. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Dr. Meisinger? Feel free to send me an email, too, if you don't want to publicly ask something or if you have a question that comes up comes to mind after we hang up. Is your email available somewhere? 
Do you have the it's, e email? It's jmeisinger at nationalrenderers.com, and info at nationalrenderers.com also gets to me. Last call for questions. All right, hearing none, we'll go ahead and conclude the call today. Thank you again, Dr. Meisinger, for presenting on rendering. We could greatly appreciate your time and have a pleasant day, everyone. Okay, thank you.